Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of From Page to Stage. I'm your host Wendy Corner and this podcast is for you if you're an author. Maybe you're an author who has got your stuff published. Now not published it doesn't have to be a solo book. We've had people on this podcast who are bloggers, who have written poetry, parts of anthologies, some of them have done their own solo books as well. We've also had people who have done both page and stage. Some who have done both, some who have done only the page and are working towards the stage. So I think I've probably covered all bases. Welcome. If this is for you, then you're in the right place. Now, today, I would love to introduce you to a very good friend of mine, whom I'm very excited to be meeting in person in a month in the UK, both of us coming from opposite sides of the, of the world. But let me introduce you to Heidi Dunstan. Now, I first got to know Heidi all two, three years ago. But this woman is an absolute powerhouse. I could tell you more. But you know what? She knows herself better than I do. So Heidi, I'm going to bat this one over to you. Tell us a bit more about who you are and what's got you to this place in your life. Oh, thanks so much, Wendy. And it's such an honor to be here with you. We've done a couple shows together and I always love our conversation. So thank you. Thank you. And I am really excited about Cambridge. Um, so I am a certified grief educator. Um, I learned about educating people about grief after losing my husband unexpectedly in 2018. And I'm also an event manager. And so I manage the Blue Talk stages and get to travel the world, basically Canada, US and, and the UK and help people get on stages. But I'm a Blue Talks author and speaker first. So I'm excited to be here and share my experience with you. So you've done both page and stage, haven't you? I have, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's exciting. You see, what we, we've got a kind of two streams of, of interviews. We've got the inspirational people who have done both. I'm pretty much happy in both de departments. And we've got the aspirational stream. So these are the people who've done the page, but maybe aren't quite so comfortable with being on the stage yet. I find a lot of people who are in that, oh, I couldn't possibly be a speaker because I'm an author with that either or thinking I say to them can you do a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody uh, yes then you can do a podcast because that in effect is what we're doing the background audience that we will bring into the conversation but in front of you just the one person so Heidi I'm going to ask you what prompted you to start writing oh that's a, that's a long story. Um, mm. I have a dream to have my name on a on a book, and I always have since I was a little girl. I did not know and that. And you did not know that. I was actually um, they they were testing me in grade one to be in special ed, and thankfully one day a, a substitute teacher came in and said, "Has anybody ever tested her vision?" And they found out these big blue eyes just don't work very well, and they need contacts and glasses. And so um, I was really behind in grade one. And by the end of grade one, and at Easter, I got my glasses. And by the end of grade one, I was reading at a grade three level and I loved books. And I always thought that was gonna be, I was gonna be an author. That was gonna be my dream job, was to be an author. Exciting. Crazy story, hey? Yeah. So that was what prompted you. Were you, were you doing creative writing in school? I did some, yeah. I was published in in the school newspaper and things like that. Uh, lots lots of stories, things like that. And then later in life, it kind of fell off as I went into university and I wasn't working in the creative. Well, I was working in a very different creative space. Um, and then, yeah, when I started moving back into like some of my personal development work in my early thirties, that's when it started coming back out and being able to say, hey, some of the things I have to offer that I've lived through, I could help others with. And yeah, lo and behold, here I am, my late husband. And now that he's gone, is actually helping me still make my dreams come true, even though he's not here anymore. Isn't it wonderful when you can frame things in that way, that almost like being planted in the ground, his legacy is blossoming now through you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I can Beautiful, really, hey? 
I can absolutely yeah. relate. Thank you for sharing that. So you've been writing since you were a wee girl. Yeah, just about 40 years. Need to add that bit, but thank you. <laughs> My audience, I'm not ashamed we of start, it. audience, before we hit record, we were talking about age and how long we've been doing things. So um, that that's what that little thing is about. <laughs> Jab came in. Tend to forget that there are some pre-recording conversations that go on. So just to fill you in that that's what we were on about. <laughs> yep. So you, you've been doing your creative writing for a, a decent amount of time. Okay, you had a hiatus in the middle, but now we're back in, getting back to it. So I'm going to ask you, when did you start speaking? So I've always been a bit of a teacher. And so mm -hmm. I have facilitated workshops and facilitated courses but typically around stuff that's safe, computers, how to use Microsoft Office. I, I, I would teach PowerPoint classes, teach people how to use LinkedIn. And I loved it. I loved being able to teach people. I loved watching them do things. And then I got hired at a college to, to do like a five-week course. And I loved it because I was, I was able to help them like with computers, but I also helped them with their lives, right? Because when you're in school and post-secondary, you're kind of at a, a transitional point, right? And so I got to really help and inspire people. Um, so I've been in front of rooms, but honestly, the first big stage I took with multiple hundreds of people was my husband's funeral and doing his eulogy. I honor you for being able to do that because you, yes. I could not. Yeah, I really couldn't do the eulogy at my husband's funeral. That was, that was just beyond me at that point. Did one for my father. But no, that that oh golly! And your husband was very popular. You said there were lots and lots of people at his at his there funeral. Was, there were six hundred people live in the room, and a thousand people watched the recording. Yeah. yeah. But honestly, like it was it was interesting. The the pastor who served the who who helped to do the service, he came to me after he's a good friend of ours, and he said, you know. I'm really glad I spoke before you. He goes, because not I've been to a lot of services where the widow does part of this. I I'd only did a third of the, the eulogy. Mm -hmm. um, but he said, you had them laughing. He goes, you had them crying. You had them laughing and crying at the same time. He goes, you were captivating. Because all I did was tell our story. And 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 I did it. Yeah, I mean, you know me. I've got a, a wacky sense of humor and kind of just off the cuff and and I really just made it like we were. And and that's what I wanted to convey to people. And I mean, I, there, if you watch the video, there's a couple couple points where if you know me well enough, I do do choke up. But I, I kept it together. As soon as I left the podium, Wendy, I lost my noodle. But, uh, you know, I, I, I believe that it was something that I was meant to. That was a piece that was part of my send off for him. Yeah, yeah. And it's amazing, isn't it, how the people in the audience will take out of whatever you say what they need. Yeah. And what they pick up may not have been what you intended to lay down, but yeah. they picked up from their own perspective something that was inspiring. Well, um, it was interesting because, I mean, my mom being my mom, and uh, I love her dearly, she did not want me to do that speech. And um, she was like, you know, I'll read it. Your brother could read it like anybody. And then the morning of the service, I was practicing. And I said, can I just, can you give me some feedback? And and she's like fussing over my hair and she's doing the mom things, right? And, um, yeah. and I do this 15 minute talk and, and she's got tears in her eyes. And she goes, I now realize, she goes, nobody could read these words other than you. And I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't write a talk that somebody else could read. No. Not for that. No. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just, it didn't, that's not who I am. You know, I, I, I'm not sure how I could be a speech writer for other people. I'm really good at crafting ideas, yeah. but I have a really hard time putting words in somebody else's mouth. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I know I've, I've proofread and kind of edited for a previous mentor of mine who is, his first language is Portuguese. He's Brazilian. And going through the manuscript, it's not really how you'd say it. But I had to 
take that step back and go, actually, Wendy, as long as it makes sense, you've got to maintain his voice. Yeah. So there were things that me as a native British English speaker was going, Ooh! but no, this was his voice and it had to be maintained. So absolutely, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. You've got to do it from their perspective. So nobody better than your own, your own self. Yeah. Wow, I honor you, my love, because that I can only imagine how tough that might have been. Um, but yeah, you know the, what? Uh, it, it was. It took a lot of courage. Mm. But I would have felt unfulfilled if I didn't do it. Yeah, I needed to do it. It was part of my peace to him. Yes. Um, that day was. It was weird. It was January in Canada, Ooh. where. It can be very, very cold. And oddly enough, it was 12 degrees Celsius. And my husband was a fireman. I was at a church that overlooked the Rocky Mountains. It was just a beautiful day to send him off. And I am just grateful that I was able to share with people a glimpse of how special he was to me. And that could only have come from you. I mean, everybody there would have had their own experience of him. Yeah. And so that's what people would have been relating to. And the fact yeah. that you've managed to bring out the the, oh, yeah. the, the, the positives and the, the not so happy times. Yeah. I remember with my mother-in-law who passed away from motor neuron disease, ALS in North America. She had a, a tube feed into her stomach. And she used to test out her new carers by as they're pouring the liquid in, she'd make them laugh. She'd, she'd start to laugh, which, of course, her diaphragm was doing this. And the the liquid <laughs> spurted up back over them because they were so yeah. intent on what you yeah, yeah. I sort of did that one day and I went, you did that on purpose, didn't you? And I saw the only movement she had left was that. And I, you could see this glint in her eye. So that tale was told at her funeral. and. Almost her entire care staff, the, the only person who wasn't there had to be on duty with somebody else. Mm -hmm. But everybody else made the effort to be there. And they all went, yep, she did that with me. <laughs> and you knew that that was a, a, a real fun memory. Yeah. Um, because I don't know how much you know about ALS. It's a, it's a brutal disease. disease. Yeah. yeah. But there was that little spark that maintained all the way through so yes i can fully appreciate the the the, the, the good memories and the as well as the shh, this is why we're here um sorry yeah <laughs> Emma, <are> yours not <laughs> mine <laughs> <Bleep>. mm. okay <laughs> so um that's what so you, you you've been speaking I've, I've got a question for you growing up in north america I understand that in, in the US, doing presentations in school is part of the curriculum. Is that the same in Canada as well? It is, yeah. Because that's not the case in the, U, in the UK. Oh, aren't you lucky? Yeah, I mean, okay, we have a show and tell thing, but that, that's literally very early primary. Um, sort of maybe by the by the age of eight, that that gets dropped off because we've got a bit more, a bit more serious about this content and curriculum, you know. Yeah, no, so, part of that is curriculum. I know, but th this is this is the thing. So it, it's been interesting for me as a non North American to to witness some of the, the blocks that speakers have going. Well, I was laughed at when I was in school for doing the presentations, and that meant you, you shut down, not doing that again. So it's interesting from my perspective to see that that situation. And, and it's actually reasonably common in my conversations with people from North America. How much yeah. did you have to do then? Um, you know what? I had to do it often, but I love teaching. Like, I, I think I always have enjoyed it. And so it was, it, I enjoyed it. The place that I struggled with is I often sometimes would ask questions, especially around math, because I I missed basically eight months of math in grade one. I didn't, like, reading you can hear, but math you can't, you need to be able to see it. And I didn't physically see it. Yeah. And so I was always behind in math. And 
So I would ask questions because I never understood. And years, like grade eight, grade nine, if I had a teacher who didn't have patience, they would they didn't have patience for my questions. And so I've had to really work around be having the courage to ask questions. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and even now it's still one of those things where if I'm if I'm uncertain around math, I just glaze over it. Right. Or or I've I I boldly tell people like time zones. When you were telling me earlier that all the different time zones are in, I'm like, yeah, I don't. I would just tell you cancel it and I'll reschedule when you put your schedule set up right. Right. Like I use a time zone time zone converter and mm, oh, so do I because because I like I mix them up all the time. Mm. I mean, yeah. as, as far as time zones concerned, I, I've I've got the Eastern time, I've got the Pacific time sorted out. Are you Central get. Um... No, I can't remember which way around they are. And my thoughts are, well, if you're in either of those time zones, you're so used to doing the translation yourself anyway. I'll leave it to you. Yeah. 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 Great fun. Not. Okay. So we've worked out then that you've been writing since you were a wee girl. You've been speaking and got that, that teaching bug. I've got to ask you, when you were little, did you teach your headies and dolls i don't remember okay um my hunch would be no right but that was that was just because of the upbringing upbringing that i had um Mm. but i can say like i grew up in the sea cadet movement where we had to teach each other like lots of times they would be like hey this is everybody has a different part of the lesson to learn and you have to teach each other and part of that was teamwork Right. Gosh, that was useful. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it's fascinating for me to sit back and listen to the totally different way of, of educating. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so you you actually had to think about what you were teaching somebody. Yes. And, and how you would want to learn it. Yeah. So that they would understand it. Yeah. Which is an invaluable skill. Mm-hmm. Valuable life skill. And it, it's it's a really cool life school skill, but it's also a really cool confidence booster because when you actually watch somebody and the light bulb turns on, like that that's magic for me. Yes. That's like uh, it. I just love watching somebody go. Oh, I get it. You know, yeah, it's fun. And particularly fun. with with your your teaching around the the computer stuff. You were saying about being, I mean, Excel and I have an interesting relationship. I know yeah, certain everybody things, has one. Yeah. But I know it's capable of so much more. And how? To what, find you're out. not using pivot tables? Do what? <laughs> exactly, right? Uh, yeah, they do pivot tables. But it's like, you know, yeah, it's. And, and and when I was teaching college, sometimes that's what I would do. If it was a really hard lesson, I would be like, hey, you and you and you are my strongest students. I want you to teach your class. And they were like, what? And guess what? It helped them instill the lesson for themselves. It helped the students because they like were like, hey, if my peers can do it, I can do it. Yes. And 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 it was just it was fun to watch because it wasn't always they didn't always have to listen to me, right? And so it changed it up and and they paid attention. And so there's always value in doing that. Yes. Um, and and when you do it so that it, there's like three or four people, um, they all everybody learns their all the different learning styles come out, mm-hmm. right? Especially if you're a smart facilitator and you find somebody who's kinesthetic, can you find somebody who's auditory and you find somebody who's visual and right and and so then all of a sudden people's needs are getting met yes absolutely mm-hmm. oh yes you gotta be smart definitely Never. Lovely. thank you very much for sharing that so i'm going to ask you now what are you working on at the moment what's percolating oh what's not um so <laughs> that's it's a matter of uh the the one resource i need is time but um so i am working I, i've got a book a, a book chapter in blue talks volume i think it'll be it's a special edition 
So that's coming out later this fall. And I'm excited because you and I get to share a book together because you're in that same book. Yay! So that book's just gone off to the editor. Um, the forward is being written, has been, uh, there's pieces of it that were um, of a never been aired interview with the late Bob Proctor. And then his son is also contributing to the forward. So I'm really excited about that. That mm -hmm. chapter is on what to say and not say to somebody who's grieving so we don't lose the legacies of those we've lost. Um, yeah. and, and that's my biggest passion is teaching people what to say and not say, because I truly do believe it is our duty for the people left behind to carry on the legacies of those we've lost. Yes. And if we don't start learning how to talk to somebody who's grieving, we will lose those legacies because people stop talking about them. Yeah. And, and it is uh, it, certainly those of us in, who've grown up in the West, it's not generally spoken about. I mean, for my generation and certainly moving forward and probably the generation before, death was medicalized. It was a way it, you, you didn't generally see dead bodies. Yeah. And even that that concept, I mean, some children have experienced the death of a grandparent, but very often it's hushed up. You, you don't take them to the funeral. You don't expose them to that. And so I didn't have the language Yes, I, I witnessed both grandparents, three, two grandparents within memory of, of passing away, but I wasn't allowed to go to a funeral. Yeah. And when I did go to a memorial service, I was talking to some of my granny's um, friends. I'm six. And I blurt out, I know what granny's doing. She's in heaven knitting jumpers for the angels. Because that was my experience of my grandmother. She knitted all my jumpers. And I got roundly chastised for being so flippant. Yeah. That was my experience of her. And we've yeah. all got different experiences. And it, it, it is. So, I mean, I've, I found your work incredibly valuable. Incredibly valuable. Thank you. And, um, yeah, I've, I've remembered a number of your pointers for people who've been recently bereaved as well. So thank, thank you. you. I've, I've certainly learned from you. Certainly. Thank learned. you. So that's the chapter that's coming. Mm -hmm. Off air, you kind of hinted that there may be down the track a solo book in progress. Yes, I have. Uh, again, the, I, I just need the one resource that we all can't pay for, which is time. Um, mm -hmm. So I have, I have one, I have another collaboration book, but I'm the one compiling it. Oh, right. um, so that is a book that is um, 10 of Mike's friends have contributed chapters on who he was to them Oh, lovely! and really kind of his legacy. So it's really a passion project, mm. um, but one that is near and dear to my heart. Yes. Um, and so I, I need to set some time aside this summer to really kind of put it all together because all the pieces are there. I just okay. need to string them all together. Um, and then the other one is really more about the what to say and not say to somebody who's grieving. Mm -hmm. um, I have one other book that I actually forgot to tell you about that my name is on the front cover, a good co-author. Um, I've, I've done a few chapters in books actually, mm -hmm. but the one that isn't about grief is I had the honor of being the event manager for a conference in Chicago um, earlier this year called Creative Con. What we did was all the speakers, we didn't have the budget to bring them in. So we said, hey, what we'll do is everybody write a chapter on what they're speaking about and we'll compile it into a book and make it a best-selling author book. And so Creative Con Book Volume 1, it came out in February and it was a really cool honor to be able to, we had a number of speakers that were at that event that it did not have the best-selling author title and some of them had never published before either. And so what a cool gift to be able to hand mm -hmm. somebody this book and that they're in it and then say, and by the way, you're an international best-selling author. It was so cool. So that those are kind of fun. Just, it was a project that kind of came that I was like, Hey, let's do this. I've never mm -hmm. seen it be done before. Mm -hmm. And uh, how many times do we go to an event and we get all these action items that we want to do. And we go home and we action about 20% of them. Cause we can't even remember them all. Yeah. If you all of a sudden had your $10 book show up at your door, like three days later, boom done right so yeah. that was a really cool project so you know I, I encourage people that want to write think outside the box it doesn't have to be 
a, a huge book. And, and I mean, right now I'm watching people publish books that are under a hundred pages and they're getting rave reviews because people are actually sitting down and reading them in a, in a sitting. It doesn't need to be a, a like, don't write a 300 page book because then it's going to hold somebody's door open. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't need any more door stops. Um, and so turn around and, and, and think outside the box, keep a really tight message mm -hmm. and, and keep a short book and, and, you know, you'll, you'll be able to watch well, it soar. The thing is we've, we've got such a short attention span these days, partly courtesy of these little babies. Um, Social so media, that yeah. you, you get the, was it TLDR too long? Didn't read mm -hmm. even on, on social posts. Yeah. So yeah. Short, I mean, because in theory, what you could do is you could even have a series of books so that one chapter would be in each book. Yep. It's one way of making yeah. sure people come back for the next installment. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm presently writing. Writing at the moment is gathering data for my solo book which is coming out next year, My Life with 20 Kilos. So those of you who haven't yet caught up on this, for speakers on the road, what do you need to do? What do you need to have in your physical 20 kilos weight limit? Most airlines, it's 23, but not within Asia, it's 20. And then also looking at the, the mental stuff that we carry around, the internal scripts, as I call them. What do you need to carry with you? And what can frankly let go of yeah. and thirdly the spiritual element if you're away from home you don't have all your normal cues about you what are those practices that you maintain to strengthen and deepen your relationship with whomever you consider your higher power it's the exciting thing that i'm working on at the moment because i thought i would do a little shameless plug keep listening i keep love watching. it and because our lives are similar, like you, you're traveling quite a bit and you know that one, I, I live six months a year in Canada and six months a year in Mexico. And then I'm on the road almost every two weeks, mm. two to three weeks with blue talks. Like I, I mean, when I'm, when I'm going to do a show, it doesn't matter if I'm gone five days or 12 days, I'm carry on only because I hate waiting for bags and I can't even handle the fact if it gets lost. So, but when I go to Mexico, yeah, I'm two suitcases. I, I bring I I usually have a hundred pounds stuff. Well, um, but I mean, I'm, you, I'm there you're based me. there for six months, aren't you? So you, you've yeah. got to take the, the stuff with you. Mm -hmm. Most speakers on the road have a home base, so they don't need to take a great deal of stuff with them. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not but for me. Like, like I've got a microphone. I've got like, um, and because I'm running events, like I run yeah. online events, I have two to three computers. Yes. Yeah. I've got you do that with carry on only. Um. No. When I so usually I have two computers. But, but that's yeah. not with carry on only. Surely you've got some checked in stuff as well if you're doing the full Blue Talks gig. So when, when I see you in Cambridge, I'll be carry on only. I, I'm, I am honoured to be in <laughs> the sphere of somebody who can be that minimal. The point, though, for me is that I don't have a base at the moment. So I've actually got with me on the 20 kilos bit physical stuff for tropical climbs <laughs> i've landed myself in melbourne in winter hmm. op shop on the first day thrift yeah. store second hand store however you charity store however you like to language it because i didn't have the required wardrobe and when i go back to kuala lumpur they will go to the op shop charity shop call it what you will Learning to let go and not hold on to things has been a big shift for me. A big shift for me. So yeah, the yeah. the twenty kilos, the the what's important, the what's not. And I don't know about you, but I found a big shift when we had that. Suddenly, you're no longer a wife. That identity shift and, and that will what what do I need to change? How can I change up from here on in? Um, so yeah, bringing you back to 
you well and that's what I did like I within a year I sold my house and everything and and I put a lot of stuff in storage Mm -hmm. and then I met a widow who told me her husband died 15 years before that and she had had two storage units was paying four hundred dollars a month in storage and has been for 15 years and I was like that's a lot of therapy and a lot of vacation I don't want to be that woman yeah and so I went in and I she's not actually looking at it anyway no but she was it it, you you know this when you go to open those boxes it hurts yes and and she was like I don't want to open the boxes and I was like I'm not waiting 15 years because I'll never do it no so I just ripped off the band-aid and had good people around me to support me like my mom and you know her husband and some friends and and just did a big garage sale and I was like and so now it's people are like, hey, let's go shopping. And I'm like, okay. And I just walk with them because I don't need to buy anything. Yes. Yeah. Right. Like, and and it's really fascinating. We're in a time when I used to really focus on what's the next outfit or what's the next thing or what can, what gadget. Now I'm like, I don't need it. You know? Yeah. I'm but my like- friend, you need to make some relationships and be like, hey, can I st- store one Rubbermaid bin at your house? Like that is helpful. Yeah. No, I, I have left some for, significant yeah. items back in Perth. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I have a massage couch because part of my skills is my fascial release, which incidentally I can do energetically from a distance. So just tracking that one up. That has obviously been kept and is in, in safekeeping in some of these places. Books. Mm. A lot of books have gone. But a lot of the books around my work, I can't carry with me. So those have gone to people who can meantime use them usefully. So they're not just sitting yeah. gathering dust. They're in somebody's library. And go, oh, now where's it talking about this? Where, where was that book? And they can, they can find it from there. So I was a great believer in keeping only the things that I knew other people could use as well. Yeah, very smart. And somebody said to me, are you coming back to Perth? While you're in Australia, I'm going, no, no. The thing is, it's a five hour flight. And it actually costs me more to go from Melbourne to Perth than it does from Melbourne to Bali. Crazy, hey? Go figure. Yeah. Anyway, that's a little bit of personal information audience. See, the, the thing is, when you do a podcast, you you share a bit of you. It's not purely. Yeah, it's the words. Your words have power, and learn how to travel like a nomad. Yes, that's Indeed. the title of this episode. <laughs> the, the nomad, nomad widows. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that sounds like a good, uh, a good um, tag team. There we go. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so as we're winding up, then Heidi, how do you take? The words that you've written on page, and that can be in various different forms. How do you embody that when you're on stage and speaking to an audience, a facilitation group, whatever the the audience is? You know, I like to mix. uh, One, I like to motivate people or or inspire them. That's important to me. Um, So I like to have pieces. I like to have some mic drop moments. I usually have a few statements that people go, oh, Okay. Yeah. Never thought about it that way. Mm-hmm. And then I, I always want to consider myself a trainer. I always want to teach people something. Mm-hmm. Those are three areas that are really important to me. And if I have all three of those um, areas cap- covered in some aspect, I do feel like it's more comprehensive. I will tell you that after I did my husband's eulogy, I did a blue talk um, and I've never aired that talk. I don't know. I may only show clippets of it. Yeah. Um, to this day, I watched it actually just a couple of weeks ago. It's still because it's very, very like soon after my husband died. Um, and it's still very raw for me and people in the room. There's about 80 people in the room. They said it was a great talk. Um, but for me, I still get that little taste of vomit in my mouth and I'm like, no, don't do it. Yeah. Um, but my Harvard talk, like, I really feel like I. Every time I get on stage, I always feel like I learn something new. And and when I'm speaking about grief, um, I'm I'm super empathic. I really feel people. 
and the hard part about grief is when you talk about it, so many people haven't had the opportunity to actually move through a lot of their grief yeah. or feel like it's been seen. And when all of a sudden I'm talking about stuff and they see that I see them, they start getting emotional, mm -hmm. but they never all get emotional at the same time, Wendy. And, so, <laughs> uh, and, you're, and you're being empathic with all these people in series. Can you take it? Okay, guys. Um, can can I you just, just do it all at once? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work like that. And so... Um, I'm learning how to make sure that I take care of myself on stage, um, but also acknowledge and honor the fact that I don't necessarily know what has triggered their emotions. Yeah. You know, like, for example, when I did the Harvard talk, I had a woman who came up to me and she, she'd been on our stage lots of times. I know her quite well. And she whacks me in the side of the arm and she goes, you made me cry. I was like, yeah, I saw that. And she's like, I didn't really realize that I hadn't grieved the loss that I'd retired from my career. And so I need to make sure that I don't ever make assumptions that um, what I'm saying has evoked the emotions, that it could really just be what they're experiencing. Um, and so I learn a lot as well. And mm -hmm. I, I I always see believe it's an honor to be on stage. It's an honor to serve the people. Yeah. I'm always there to serve and always there to teach. And, and I always believe that when I finish, if I go with those mentalities, I will always come back a better person. Yeah. Because that's the thing, isn't it? When when you, a number of speakers who say to me, oh, I'm just so nervous. I'm so nervous. I'm going, yeah, well, who's this about? You or your audience? And yeah. if you can make that mental flip that I'm here to serve your audience or my audience rather, then yeah it stops being about me and what people are thinking about me. And particularly with, with your topic that <laughs> talking about this and the fact that, as you, you, you pointed out just now, we tend to think, unless we think about it more carefully, that grief is only about losing a person. Yeah. But as you pointed out in that example, losing a career and whether that's one that you have retired from or whether it's one that you've been exited, exited from. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, then, then there, I mean, that might have a different feel about it anyway. One was your attention and the other certainly was not. Yeah. Again, with the, with the, the people passing away, there's a different feel around that. And, and we've, we've spoken about this before that, that some people who have had the, the planning, if you will, if you know that you're the, the, the person that who is who is very ill is ill, then then there's a certain amount of preparation you can do, but you're still going to feel the shock when it happens. And there's the other sort that you and I both had, which was that was it. No preparation time at all. Different, but both have that shock element. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's also fun to remember the positive things that you had because however much that is painful. When I was talking to my father after my mother died, he said, oh, I do miss her. I really do miss her. I said, I know you do. And I'm glad you do. Hello, you were married for 63 years. But tell me about something that you really remember that brings, you a, sm brings a smile to your face. Flipped him around very quickly. And once he could focus on that, he was starting to smile and have a giggle. That and conference that I, I did in, in Chicago, coming home, and, and I mean, you'll see me, and, and when I'm running a conference, I, I go full throttle. There's, they're long days. So I get on the flight to go back to Mexico, and I, I want to sleep. And this dude comes up beside me, and he goes, hi, I'm Roger. I'm going to sit beside you today. And I was like, oh, I guess I'm not sleeping today. And Roger and I talked that entire flight. And at some point it came up that I was a widow and he is a retired pharmacist. And we had a great conversation and he asked amazing questions as most pharmacists do. And at one point in the conversation, he gave me the greatest compliment, which was, I wish I met your mic. Right, which told me that he heard me and he saw how amazing this man was in my life. And, mm -hmm. and he wanted a part of that too. And I actually, when I was in Chicago last week, 
had dinner with his wife and his um old uh, her best friend but she used to work with him uh he wasn't well enough to see me but um you know like those are those are the reasons why I want to do this work and why I believe it's important for us to do the work that we do because you know I think about like the four big superstars that just passed away this weekend in the U.S. and imagine if when they died we didn't get to ever talk about Richard Simmons or Shannon Dordery or uh, you know and, and we lost these legacies it's just as tragic if we lose the legacies of the people that we love. One of the things you, you say is that don't stop talking about them. Because well, it's as simple important. as asking their name, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Audience, Heidi and I have and can talk the hind legs off a donkey and still persuade it to walk. So I, I'm, I'm going to sort of pull it. You're going to wrap this one up. Pull it, pull it to the end here. Because Heidi, thank you so much. We've we've gathered so much information from you. We've got in the show notes, and audience, these show notes are dynamic. So when Heidi, when Heidi shares with me when that book, the the Bob Proctor Forward Blue Talks book volume, whatever it is, comes out September, October, November, the in the the autumn, the fall, towards the end of the year. For those of us in the southern hemisphere, that's spring. Um. We will amend those show notes so that they will be there. I will also stick out a social post gate. Remember that conversation I had with Heidi? Go back and check because we've got a new addition to it. And here's the book and go, go find it. So that's what's coming up. So this podcast will be going up relatively quickly. We will have a great fun conversation wise later on. Audience, please do follow Heidi all of us have an experience of grief at some point in our lives I thoroughly recommend that you check this lady's work out because you will benefit from it absolutely for now Heidi thank you so much for sharing your from page oh before we go have I missed anything oh I'm not giving you the opportunity to anything sure. else no I'm good we're good great thank you for sharing your from page the stage from us. Bye for now. Thank you.